stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're taping here at the Hollywood Museum in the historic Max Factor building and we're on Highland Avenue between Sunset and Hollywood Boulevard. Our guests are actor James Snyder and director Johanna Schwartz. Actor, musician James Snyder was born and raised in Northern California. He went to Christian Brothers School in Sacramento and earned a BFA in acting at my alma mater, USC. <laughs> He's been in films. He has a TV career. But to me, I'm wowed by the Broadway stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Your role in Cry Baby and If Then and all the other musical roles he's played, uh, like Billy Bigelow and Carousel and Drew in Rock of Ages. And now in a play called Casa Valentina, written by Harvey Fierstein. He wears a woman's wig. <laughs> 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 Have you had a role like that before? I haven't. Uh, I had a chance to do Rocky Horror a, a while ago, oh. but that I was I was playing Brad. So so. Oh, yeah. Brad was like goo goo, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, corny yeah. little guy. So by the end, I, I had some heels on. But, uh. <laughs> yeah, poor Brad. That's right. He gets to wear heels. Do you wear heels in this play? I do. I do. Well, tell us about tell us the story of Casa Valentina because it's very interesting. It's it's uh, built on a true story. It's, it's based on, on a true story. Uh, uh, this uh, antique dealers found this box of photos uh, in, in New York, and it had, like, my, those are some uh, ugly women. Uh, and, and then they looked closer, and it was actually men and, uh, in drag. And then they looked more into it, and it turns out there was a retreat in the Catskills Mountains in the 1960s and 70s uh, named Casa Susana. Um, and these photos were, were from that, and someone had Harvey's ear and was like, you've got to write this play, you've got to write this play, and eventually he, he looked into it, and it's a, it's a retreat for heterosexual cross-dressers. So all these guys are married <laughs> with kids, um, uh, and, but feel the need to dress as women. Is there any explanation other than that fact that you just told us? Because it's pretty interesting to <laughs> it's, see. It's fascinating. It yeah, really you know, is. Harvey does such a great job of of finding these little groups of people that that and writing plays about uh, that that maybe are underrepresented or or I, I don't know. And the the crux of of this play, what, what sort of the hook that he found and what compelled him to write it was um, uh, this is over a weekend. Our, our play takes place over a weekend, but right. um, over you a, arrived. yeah, but <laughs> over this actual summer that happened with Virginia Prince, who was who was a, a renowned. Uh, cross-dresser out here, uh, uh, the the question of whether they were going to, they were going to go legit, and in order to do that, they had to disassociate themselves from the uh, the homosexual community. So so they said oh, we're so not. They really did. So they had to, they signed a charter that were like we're not gay, we're not this, we're not that, we're not this, we're heterosexual, and in a way sort of condemned. That li the the gay lifestyle, or and, and but you say that when you yeah. come in, or they say that, right? Yeah, that we're not gay. At, at, so, yeah, yeah, I yeah mean, or at, that at we're some not. Point, yeah, yeah. It's, at one point it comes out. Um, and, it's at the Pasadena Playhouse. Yeah, it's been on off Broadway. It was uh, Broadway, it a was Manhattan Theater Club, uh, and did it was right. a wonderful show out there, and and and, I and think no singing. The, 
No singing. No singing. <laughs> but you're, you, you were trained at SC in the acting school. Yeah, I, so, yeah, so I got a BFA in, in acting. But you um, didn't go, but you're a singer. You I didn't know. go uh, well, to I the was, Thornton School. I didn't. I studied with uh, <laughs> one guy there, but I was always in an a cappella group, the SoCal Vocals. Oh, yeah, tell us about that. The, what the, is it, SoCal Vocals? The Vocal? SoCal Vocals. Now, they, they have won, like, championships. The group now <laughs> just got back from Hong Kong. Like, like oh, in, it in continues? A, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's been around. We just had our 20th anniversary. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And uh, it, what's interesting, it's sort of <laughs> before Glee ever existed. It was just oh, us right. nerds that, right. that were doing it. And so, like, some of these arrangements and, and stuff are so... And you play the guitar with them? Uh, with them or no, it's no? all a cappella. It's all yeah. totally. but I But I also have, have a band, and so, so I'm a musician also. So music right. has always right. been a big part of my so, life. So, yeah, so in high school, was it athletics or musicals? Because I think this your life started coming together in high school yeah, yeah, with in music, a sense. it yeah, seems. Yeah, well, I'd always uh, loved piano, and I was I sort of identified myself as a band geek. And then going into high school, I was like, well, I'm not going to get any girls um, with with a clarinet. So I started playing so guitar. Were, and I, I played piano as well. Oh, you played well, guitar, but, but were you on the field, uh, athletic yeah, yeah, field? Yeah, I was a soccer, well, I was a soccer player all oh, my life, were. too. Yeah, um, mm. and really loved that and spent every weekend I possibly could doing that. So and was there music in your family or show yeah. business? Well, oh, there, there is, was? actually. My, my uh, great-grandfather, great-great-great-grandfather, Eugene Delaney Halstead, um, developed some of the first bungalows here in 1889. In Hollywood? In Hollywood, in yeah, Hollywood. just right over at Vista and... Uh, uh, so you're right back home again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And my, and my grandma grew up on Curson and, and went to Hollywood High. Actually, my grandma right went there, the and street. then my grandpa went for one year, and then they moved to North Hollywood. In oh, fact, yeah. Hart Street that runs through yeah. through the valley. Uh, their last name was Hart. Is that uh, so, the yeah, street? Name, oh. That, yeah. Oh, so. that's great. We keep yeah. having people on here whose yeah. names are yeah. like Waring. We yeah. had somebody yeah. named Waring last week, yeah. and Waring runs through. Yeah. Said it was Fred Waring. Named after Amazing. Fred Waring. Wow. I didn't realize that wow. either. Yeah. Okay, let's get back. There was music in your family. <laughs> lots, lots. And, and, and show business in, in a sense, although I grew up in Northern California, but uh, um, Hollywood was always sort of a, or Los Angeles was kind of a, a home for, for a, lot, a lot of my family. You recorded an album. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in 2000, uh, in the, yeah, I, I had a record deal shortly and then sort of went off on my own. Uh, uh, the album's called L.A. Curse, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but have you always lived here? Uh, since school, yeah. Well, I, I went to USC, and then after school, I was working a decent amount in TV and film. And all here in L.A. All and here. And then how did New York start? Rock of Ages brought me out there, because before it ever went off-Broadway, we were here, actually just did it down at the Vanguard, which is a club six blocks that way. I know. Yeah. Isn't this great? Yeah. We're so central, aren't yeah. we, at the Hollywood yeah. Museum? Yeah. yeah. And but we had to be because Max Factor was doing all the makeup for the people in the studios around Amazing. here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's true. It's so true. when you yeah. walk through, did you see the makeup rooms? Walk it's through. It's amazing, this place, this building. Yeah, I've been here. Uh, not, I haven't been here since high school. Uh, not here. Oh, but like in, in this the, area? The, yeah. Well, no, I mean, I'm always around. I used to live over in Los Feliz. Hollywood so you area, lived here, but, too. Okay, yeah. so Rock of Ages took you to to, uh, to New York. New York. And, I, and the week I happened to, the two weeks that I happened to be there were the when uh, John Waters uh, was doing <laughs> Cry Baby. It was, right. audition, it was the final round of audition, so he happened to be in town. So, you know, six auditions later, um, they came and saw the workshop, and we're like, all right. Oh, yeah, from Rock. From they Rock came to ages. see the yeah. Rock of Ages and yeah. picked you? A yeah. Uh, well, at, at a workshop uh, in New York. So we were, they were trying yeah. to take it off Broadway. And so, right. yeah. So, so, so you met John. Yeah. He's a good friend of ours. He's amazing. Isn't he great? Yeah. yeah. And he's so real. Yeah, yeah, David Javerbaum, who's a lyricist, who has Hand to God. He wrote Hand to God. Oh, also. I love that, too. Um, I saw that play. His, his favorite thing to say is John's dirtiest secret, dirtiest little secret is that he's the nicest guy oh, yeah. ever. It's, it's true. so funny. It's so I, you know, true. And that, that sort of, that brought me to New York for a while. And then. That was Cry um, Baby. That and, was then, Cry Baby. and then when did then I, If Then come? If Then, uh, I came back here. I got married. Um, and then I happened to be doing. Uh, uh, Billy Bigelow at the Goodspeed Opera House in Connecticut. Oh, you were and in the East Coast again. I was on the East Coast. I was. Uh, it was. It was a little slow out here. And how are you going to pass up Billy Bigelow? And so, I know. so yeah. So I went out and and uh, David Stone, who was the lead producer on If Then, happened to come see it and said, "You got to come audition for my show." And and so and everything you do. I mean, not just you. 
But this is what I keep telling people. You've got to go do something because you never know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't think it's that important, there's somebody there. And this producer, yeah. director came yeah. and saw you? Yeah. Yeah, David said he produced Wicked and... And there uh, you were yeah. again. And and he was like, that's it, you're, you're coming to do... Well, I mean, I, I had to audition, but... Yeah, uh, I'm sure. But work. And you were singing? Did you know all the songs and how, Which, how far was... For any of these auditions, they, yeah. Well, um, I... <laughs> I actually sang Fanny for my for my um, um, carousel audition. My, and my, the only who long as I may live, Fanny, Fanny, oh, Fanny. Fanny. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it was a 1954 musical, and then they were like, "Well, do you mind doing a little bit of soliloquy?" And it's a seven and a half minute song. <laughs> and you knew it? Uh, no, I, I, I took a little bit of time. I sang "If I Loved You," and then oh uh, wow, the end part is. Uh, you know, gotta get ready before so you go out and make it or steal it or take it or die. That thing. Yeah. That's and so saying, great. And, and, That's so great. Yeah. Tell yeah. me a little bit about Star Wars, the trilogy, oh because my that gosh. took you to LA, Paris, Scotland. Yeah, oh everywhere. So it was <laughs> developed at USC actually by uh Patrick T. Gorman, who's a, a writer director ah. um uh here in town. And uh yeah, USC had a, a program where where um uh, they would take a group to the Edinburgh Fringe, and we'd do 13 oh, plays in oh, rap. Yeah. And so that was always the midnight show. But the year I went, they happened to be also doing it uh, at a in Paris at the Espace Pierre Cardin, right on the Champs Elysees. It was oh, amazing. Of course. Um, so three weeks we did Buried Child, that, and um, a mime piece called Le Bourse Le Trois, based on a Darius Milo. Um, oh, that. Yeah, and was so. that part of the trilogy? No, no, no. Oh, that was oh. just, that was, it was part of a Franco-American, like, oh, theater and dance. I see, and, I see, I see. Uh, but the trilogy, so we do, okay, so the Star Wars trilogy in 30 minutes is all three Star Wars movies I in know, a half three, hour. I know, three, three, yeah, 30 so, minutes? Yeah, How do you and do it's, it? well, now that there are more movies, it's six and 60, and then. But do people come to see you for 30 minutes, or yeah. is it a, more of a no, show? No. 30 minutes and it's the best it's you will it is the hardest <laughs> i've ever worked on a stage because it's non-stop because the dialogue is so fast and everyone's playing all different roles and like stormtroopers it's made to look like we ran out and grabbed the props from the garage and are just playing it in our backyard but so, you're not singing i'm this not is singing acting again. Yeah, believe it or not oh, i've wow. done a, i've acted every once in a while i know yeah. you've acted and before we leave i want to know you've been on broadway yeah. Uh, and you've been on stages in D.C. and Las Vegas and Sacramento and in Paris. Mm -hmm. And uh, is there any difference when you're on stage? Of course. Does it mean, I mean, is Paris different from D.C. to you or Broadway? Oh, yeah. I, every every place, every audience, every city. I, I just was on tour with it then, so I did it at the Pantages here. Uh -huh. um, De across the yeah, street. Yeah, across the street. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and in San Francisco, and Denver, in Seattle, and it, it was amazing the different personalities that, that you find in every single city. In the audience, yeah, from the, the jokes stage they get. People. Oh, yeah, from yeah, I mean the audience is probably one of the clearer ones at, at mm -hmm. what they laugh at. Like when in Denver, and I made a few Nebraska jokes in the show, uh -huh. went crazy because Nebraska's so it's, well, they, it's an eight-hour yeah. drive to to right. to. Uh, so you can feel yeah. that difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and San Francisco was surprisingly a little more reserved, or not surprisingly maybe, but in Seattle it felt like a rock concert. And it also has to do with the personality of the theater also. The do you play to them in a way? Do you well, think you, that you, the you audience learn, You learn. It's like, oh, I guess we're laughing at that. Okay. And Tomorrow. Then, yeah, and then, then yeah, well, I, yeah, so you just have to know. And, the, and these are stages that you're directed, and everything's like, told what to do you have mm -hmm. you have your own uh, way to be on stage what happens at say joe's pub mm -hmm. when you just go and sing uh, what you've done well it's it's this rare chance to to find your voice and find you ride it yourself yeah, i guess yeah, yeah. And, so, and, and that's and the difference the pattern in between it's funny la no one wants to hear you talk just play your songs and get the heck out right? so I play the hotel cafe around the corner uh -huh. uh, and it's just like my wife's saying you just talk less play more <laughs> and, but in new york they want those the stories because they will because they know I'm a theater guy here in LA. No, it's, you know. it's a ca it's cabaret in a way, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And they want to know what you. Stuff. Well, yeah. I want to know what you did yeah. when you played with what John Waters said to you, and so that comes yeah, in between. Exactly. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and how uh, like I 
I'll sometimes do a cabaret, and it'll be just about my awful audition experience. Oh, that's great! <laughs> you know? I like that. Or, or, oh, you know, I like that or a lot. meeting my wife and falling in love, or. or uh, is and your wife in show business? She's not. She's a fashion designer, actually. Oh, great. So she went to Otis downtown here, oh. and she grew up in Calabasas. And then uh, she owns a business downtown where she helps people start fashion lines. Fantastic. Yeah, so, and yeah. we're glad you came and visited yeah. us today. Thank you so Oh, I'm much. so glad, James. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. And thanks for watching that part of the show. We'll be right back with filmmaker Johanna Schwartz. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're taping here at the Hollywood Museum in the fabulous, historic Max Factor building. And our guest is award-winning documentary filmmaker Johanna Schwartz, who was raised in Newburyport, Massachusetts. <laughs> because there's a Newberry, right? Yes, there is. <laughs> there's Newburyport. Yes. She attended Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs, New York, which is so great yes, up there, yes. and uh, Goldsmiths College in London. She studied English literature and creative writing. Johanna went on to graduate from the London Film School. She's produced and directed films for the BBC, Discovery, National Geographic, the History Channel, and then PBS, CNN, and MTV, among others a lot of other <laughs> <laughs> stations. Her first feature-length film, They Will Have to Kill Us First, has been winning awards uh, on international festivals around the world. So you studied literature mm. and creative writing. Mm -hmm. uh, what path was your career going to take? Well, I think that I always wanted to be a filmmaker from the time that I was maybe six or seven years old. <gasps> how I mean, did really, you know? I'll tell you exactly how I knew. <laughs> My neighbor, came home with the first domestic video camera oh, around that time. Uh, and it was a big, clunky, I mean, you remember the, you know, they were yeah. in the 80s, it was, uh -huh. they were huge and the big VHS tapes. Uh -huh. And I just kind of saw it and fell in love. And from that moment on, started developing programs and pilots. I mean, we were kids, you with know. You, with yourself, with just your friends? my friends and the people in the neighborhood oh, and, and what have you. And so I knew that I would always go into filmmaking in some way. But, but you went to... That, yeah. English literature. I got and, really good advice, and 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 oh. so I can't even remember who it was who told me, but someone said to me, "Don't study film straight away. Go and learn things. Oh. Go and develop your mind, oh. and then when you're done, you can learn how to use a camera." So, what took you to film school in London instead of? you know, America, because we have great film schools in America. Absolutely. I just think I'm a little bit of a wanderer. Oh. You, know, <laughs> you had already wandered over there, right? I had. I, uh, I went, whilst I was at Skidmore, I went over for a year to Goldsmiths College, sort of fell in love with this idea that it was a completely new culture that I was unfamiliar with, oh. and decided just, you know, to keep going. And, and from there, all of my work... Uh, in the UK has always taken me abroad in Africa, the Far East, oh, the Middle East. Oh, but that's East. how it yeah. started. But how did you get your first break, say, with the BBC mm. or Channel 4 or Channel 5? What were you doing? It was a lot of chutzpah. Was it? <laughs> you don't seem like you're that pushy. <laughs> I, it, was, it was a lot of, yeah, it was a lot of cajoling and a lot of, I mean, you know, straight out of film school, I, I wound up on a couple of productions and, and from there talked my way into an office of, a, of an executive and pretended we had met and, you know, it, it's oh, all of that it. stuff. And really? Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, if, if, if you work in documentaries, you have to have that kind, that attitude. Do people do that with you? We've met, we've seen <laughs> each other, I want to be in your film. <laughs> Not yet. Not you're, yet. You're used to it. <laughs> not you're not right, yet. Man. But so when you so you got your break by mm. that. But when you worked for the History Channel and Discovery and those different, did they give you assignments or yeah, did always. you do your own? Oh, always. Okay. So for many many years, I worked to commission. So there would be a project. They would be looking for a director. I would do that. And I worked in television maybe between ten fifteen years on and off. Oh, you did a very long time. Were you writing? I did directing. Just directing, directing. And directing and producing. I mean, in, in, in TV in the UK, certainly in factual television, you, it's, you do everything. I mean, there, there aren't really separate roles in, in that way, on documentaries anyway. So it was really after I'd done it for quite some time that I realized I needed to find my own story. I, needed to, I really felt that I needed to, to do it myself. And that's when I left and started working on They Will Have to Kill Us First. So, so this is what led to They Will Have to Kill Us First? Mm. Just because you needed, I needed to do it but you my had, way. You had already written small uh, 
films, right? You'd already done some short films. Well, I, yeah, I was directing series for the Discovery Channel and, yeah. and series for BBC World. But it and wasn't anything of this length. It wasn't How mine. Like, it I, wasn't mine. It wasn't yours. Mm. And so, let me see the name of your... They will have to kill us first. <laughs> I love this. Tem I this is temporary. This is temporary. I can't believe it because <laughs> it's so clear. Hold it for the camera. It's Can you so percent? clear. Yeah. Did you ever take this marketing marketing classes? Isn't that wonderful? Well, you know, we, we had our world premiere at the wonderful South by Southwest Festival in 2015, the world premiere of this film. And it was when I was planning my trip there, I knew I needed to do something to get people's attention. South by Southwest is a madhouse. There are bands everywhere. There are films everywhere. There's tech people, you know, from people from the White House. You know, there's just, it's, it's rammed with, with every person imaginable, every creative person imaginable. And so I knew we had to stand out. T-shirts wasn't going to happen. Caps without posters, you know, none of that really. really? Was I thought, what can we do? And I suddenly thought, let's print up a thousand temporary tattoos with the film's title, and let's tattoo every single person in Austin, Texas. So you tattooed the people? We just went round, we went? Went, we went round the bars, we went round the, the, the parties. We went, people were open to it? Yeah, they absolutely loved it. And it's so clear. Yeah, it looks fantastic, it looks very real, doesn't it? Yes, but the point is, usually a tattoo you can't read, yeah. it gets muddled. <laughs> but this is very clear. Yeah, yeah. I mean, tell us what, tell us why they have to kill us first. Who, what is it about? So the story follows a group of musicians in Mali, in West Africa, after music has been banned. And I think that this is something that everybody is shocked by, the idea of banning music. It's but impossible that's to comprehend, now, isn't it? Yeah, it's happening. It everywhere. happened in Mali, and this is so brilliant that you're showing what happens, mm. and you can't keep that spirit down. Absolutely, the musicians were so unbelievably inspirational. It was it was kind of a shock to me that the film ended up being so uplifting, considering I was walking straight into a war zone. But how did you find this place and this area to go to? Well, I'd worked in Africa many, many, many times. You know, from Malawi, uh, Tanzania, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire. Is I that mean, right? I covered Africa for for a while, uh -huh. and so I I was very aware of Mali because it's where music began. The blues that we know of started there. Started in Mali. That's where it all came from. Right? Music began but in Mali. You, but you can hear the blues in their music. Well, that's the blues came out of the music. So yeah, yes, yeah, you can hear Absolutely. it. I, when you say that, I wasn't thinking about it. Yeah. But, but it is a very bluesy thing, and it's, I thought it was yeah. very American. Yeah. When I was listening to it's the it. other way around. It's the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> it's the other way around. So I was very, very aware of the music. A massive fan of of Malian musicians like Ali Farcatore. And when I read that music was being banned in Mali, it was like the, the world kind of stopped for a split I second. See. And I tried to absorb that information, and I couldn't, so I just got on a plane and went. So what did you do? Camera, were cameras allowed? Yeah, I grabbed my, my camera woman, and we just, we just sort of landed. I mean, at that point, when I arrived, the whole north of the country had been taken over by jihadists, but the oh. south of the country was still in the hands of the government. Oh, so so we flew down into there? the south, uh -huh. and then we would make sort of short trips, you know, up and, and, and east and, and film, and then, you know, escape back down to the south. How where, long I were filmed you for filming? Two years. For two years, yeah. were you in and back out? Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I was pregnant at the time as well. Oh my God! Yeah, I flew in. I was five months Is pregnant. Is your baby singing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we call her. We, yeah, <laughs> baby Molly. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, but but those people were persecuted. Mm. What did they do? Mm. Well, everyone reacted in a completely different way, as you can imagine. I mean, if you can imagine your own life. And here you are, and a deeply creative person. You wake up one morning, music is banned, or, or you know, uh, filmmaking is banned, or writing is banned, all these things yeah. that we love. And you think, how, how would I react? And every single person reacted in a different way. And that's what we were looking for. We were looking for people who had different relationships. So some people, when told they couldn't sing, decided to sing even louder and protest. Some people... Were those part of your group? Mm -hmm, uh -huh. mm -hmm. And some people um, decided to comply with the jihadists and Sharia law because that was the only way that they felt that they could survive. So we found people that were reacting in really different ways, but everyone was inspirational. Were you in a dangerous position? Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Although it's, you know, it's relative. You know, it, it, <laughs> it's it, relative? It, it, <laughs> They're shooting over my head today, so it's okay. <laughs> you, know, it, you know, it's interesting. We, I think things seem a lot scarier when you're watching them from very far away. And when Exactly. And when you're there, it's, right. you're in a completely different situation. And I was always very aware that I could get on a plane and leave. 
and the people I was filming, (laughs) the people I was filming couldn't. And that's and that once you have that perspective and you realize that you can escape, but they can't, it 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 changes the way you view the situation. You wrote the story with a with the manager of a a Grammy award winning -winning group. I don't know. Tanari Wen, yeah. Tanari Wen are are one of the most famous bands to come out of Mali. Oh, they are from there. They're from Mali, yeah. And they won a Grammy. And Andy Morgan managed them for many, many years. Um, And now he's a journalist and an author. But then how did you decide? What did you write? Did you? Tape everybody first and then write the story? How, what well, was the process? Yeah, writing a documentary is sort of, um, it's, it's odd because people don't quite understand how that works. Right. And I think that with every documentary, it works in a slightly different way, unhelpfully. Yeah. Um, but for us, the writing had sort of, there were, I guess there were two main pockets of writing. The first pocket was, who do we follow? Who do we film? Right. So it was sort of like casting, writing, casting, that kind of thing. And we interviewed lots and lots of musicians, and then we settled on the group that we thought, were the most interesting in terms of being able to relate the story to a wider audience. So that was sort of one. There were a lot of groups? Yeah, we we yeah, we we met a lot of and musicians. And they were still playing and they weren't afraid? Some we no, so, no, a lot of them were afraid, a lot of them weren't playing. Some were, some were protesting. Mm-hmm. And we just, you know, we across the board we we found a lot of different people and you know, really spent some time on the ground researching. So that was step 1 of writing. So that was step one. Mm. Step two, you're right, is afterwards. You have you have two <laughs> years of footage. It. I know. What you have <laughs> hard drive after hard drive after hard drive after hard drive, and you go, okay, now we need to write this thing. And that's when you you know you bring in your classical you know five act structure, and you really kind of work through it and, and work out how how is the audience going to be able to absorb the story. I, I've always heard that. You know, when you write your documentary first, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. So when you go back to edit it, it's totally a totally different. different you're right. You're writing story. constant, and I'm writing and editing your mind. every single day. And something happens, and it's not sort of what I expected. And I think, okay. And then you have to immediately just go. Uh, everything changes from but, that point on. But you change with it. You have to. Where did you edit? We edited in London, where I live. I live in London, England. Oh, you live in London. Now? Yeah, yeah. And uh, well, we... welcome. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> yeah. This is actually my first time in LA. Is it? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm so an glad. East Coast girl. I'm so glad you're here, and you're in the museum, it's so which fantastic. is so different, isn't it? I love it. So, what kind of music? Do they play? What's the name of the group that you follow? Well, Songhai Blues is one of them, and they are an incredible, like, um, I sort of call them a desert punk band. Mm. And there's a lot of blues, there's a lot of punk, there's a lot of the John Lee Hooker, there's, you know, really? the, yeah, there's, and, and, but it's all sort of grounded in this very traditional desert, uh, uh, Sahara sort of um, And the soulful. backgrounds are so beautiful mm. that you film. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then what happened to these musicians? Well, uh, different things. So Songhai Blues, um, they had just formed the band when I when I met them. They they formed their band because of the conflict. Oh, that's interesting. Which is very interesting. So there were four boys. They were all on the run. They all had had run-ins with jihadists in their hometown, uh, hometowns. They all kind of converged in the capital of Bamako, which was under... Is that where you were? That's where I was. And uh, decided that, well, they were being told that they couldn't sing or play music, so they decided they needed to... Really, so they were going to do it. They were going to do it. So they, their band formed because of the conflict, which is a really bizarre thing to wrap your head around. And it's sort of right. like an, uh, the ultimate silver lining, you know, right. from a conflict like this. And in the course of time that we filmed them, they were discovered by Damon Albarn, lead singer of Blur and Gorillaz. They were catapulted onto the international stage. They signed a record deal with Atlantic Records here in the U.S. Just within the last year. The last couple of years, yeah. yeah. The first African band to sign to Atlantic since 1972. But then what happened? And Can now they they're... leave? Could they leave the country? Well, they ended up, you know, with, they ended up uh, with help from their record label and, and their new out. managers, and they, you know, they managed to get visas. And I mean, this is the difficult thing. That's what I mean. Yeah. They can be a big hit, and they can be signed Absolutely. for the first time, but they can't leave the exactly. country. Exactly. So they managed to leave, and and now they're on tour all around the world. They just came back from a three-week tour in Australia where they were a massive uh, hit. They're uh, um, in the charts. They're in the top 20 in New Zealand. They are huge in the UK. What instruments do they play? Guitar, bass, and drums. That's it? Yeah. And that's that kind of music? Classic, you know, four guys. Um, lead guitarist, singer-guitarist, bassist, drummer. And the sound that they produce is incredible. Incredibly joyful. Because it's so uplifting. It's very uplifting. And you've been so interesting. I'm so glad you were with us today. <laughs> They're amazing. Johanna, thank you so much. Thanks. And good luck in your film and the films to come.
next thank to come. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching. Keep writing to J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com.